My name is Tamsin Althway and you're listening to Eleven, the official theatre podcast. Hello and welcome to Eleven, the official theatre podcast that brings the biggest stars and creatives together in one place to discuss life in the arts. Today we step into the world of stage and screen to join an actress that's become a household name and a theatrical leading lady. She first walked into our lives as Mel Owen on BBC's EastEnders, an instantly recognisable television and soap character and soon to be household name. Since then, her career has been on the up. Now with teledramas, documentaries and stage productions under her belt, including Midsummer Murders, Inside Number 9, New Tricks, Foils War, Silent Witness, The Bill, Stepping Out, Sweet Charity and many, many more. It's time to discover something a little bit different and her latest project is certainly that. Introducing The Haunting of Alice Bowles, an exciting new online supernatural thriller sure to raise quite a few hairs and leave audiences gripped. Get ready as up next on Eleven, let's talk fighting creative snobbery, getting spooked, and what's still on the wish list with the fantastic Tamsin Althwaite on this, the next episode of Eleven, the official theatre podcast. Just to let you know, due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, Tamsin and I connected digitally, so please forgive any brief moments while we wait for the internet to catch up. Enjoy. Please help me welcome to Eleven Next. It's Tamsin Althwaite. Tamsin, hello. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing good, thank you. Yes, very well. You? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's a real pleasure to get the opportunity to talk to you because I feel like I've followed you on lots of different journeys that you've been on, not just on screen, but of course on stage as well. You have a real mix of a career and... There's so many things that I would love to talk to you about. And I've got a list of things that I'm like, right, I've got to ask her about this. But the one thing that I wanted to start with more than anything is your love of the stage. I think it'd be fair of me to say that you, your career sort of started off and you thought your career was going to go down the route of theatre. I know that was one of the first projects that you did was theatre. And therefore we can say that you are a true lover of the stage. Oh, yes. It sounds a real cliche. Well, it doesn't. It sounds a bit... um cheesy when I say this but when I do a piece of theatre which I've always tried to do at least every two years sometimes you miss a year or I'll do a couple of productions in one year but I try to just to remind myself why I'm doing it so I suppose it sounds a bit cheesy but when I do a theatre project it feels like coming home. And you're really proud of your theatre heritage as well there tends to be dare I say a little bit of snobbery around theatre you know that it's slightly different to being on screen but that's not something that you echo you love being on the stage and you're proud to sort of vocalise that. Yes I mean I really do think in theatre musical theatre is the most difficult discipline and for me it's if, if if you can do musical theatre, if you have honed that craft, then you can pretty much do anything. Mm. I suppose in television, I feel the same about doing a soap, because if you can do that and that time and, you know, I think you can pretty much do most things. So I really love it when um, when I do theatre again and, and you, you see people that haven't done it for a long time and they are really fearful and nervous about, the liveness of it and how am I going to do this after doing years of TV. Um, It's really lovely seeing the process from that to (sighs) loving it. And it happens every time you do a theatre job. There's always somebody that is like, I haven't done it. Sometimes it's me, you know, I haven't done it for a while. And just watching the confidence grow and the love for your craft come back. Because you became a household name on television and loads of people have seen you in so many different variances on screen. Do you, are you sort of cast with that sort of, that sentence that I hate, which is, oh, I didn't realise you could work on the stage. I didn't expect this of you. You know, I didn't realise you could sing. Do you ever get that? I think a lot less now, a lot less now. But I think when I did Sweet Charity, I think a lot of people were like, oh, I can't believe that you can do those other things. Yes. But, you know, that's that was what I started doing. So but there is a lot of snobbery, I think, that that actors come across when you're doing musical theatre that you might not be right for television. And I think one of the wonderful things about Julia Crampsey, who was the cast and director at EastEnders, is she sees that she sees that that discipline of a musical theatre performer, how 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 difficult that is, you know, because you're thinking about three different things and also how easy 
if you can pick stuff like that up, you can pick up going on to a mm. soap quickly and working out your positions and where the cameras are. So she's always had a knack of getting in musical theatre people into EastEnders because she believes that too. And that I think is really lovely when that, you know, you don't see that snobberism in, in a casting. Definitely. And I always think it's nice that we see musical theatre mm. people trying to venture out and actually vice versa, people that we've traditionally seen on screen going into the stage. I feel like it does sort of push away any, any negativity or doubts that people have. And I always love it when you see people really succeed because I imagine it is, it is quite nerve wracking, if that's the right word, I imagine to try and push yourself outside of the bubble that's made you successful. I, you know, that is, it, with one of a better phrase, it is a big leap. You know, you do have to sort yes. of challenge yourself. Were you ever sceptical or nervous about even going to the screen or perhaps the other way? No, see, I was a jobbing actress who just, every job felt like another job. I never had the feeling of, oh, this is gonna change my life or now I've made it. That doesn't exist. The making it doesn't exist, you know? So yeah. we're on this, journey of our careers to maintain a career is pretty successful mm. um, and rather than try and climb somewhere and I think that I don't know I never felt like oh I'm out of my depth I just felt like oh this is a this is a new job and of course when I got EastEnders it was a three-month contract with a three-month option so I just thought I'd be gone in three months and that would be that you don't necessarily you know, your character might work, the storylines might not work. So I, I took each day as it came, really. And then when I kept being extended and then it was a successful character, that was an extra bonus. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, I look at each job as like, oh, this will be fun. What can I get from this? Yeah. But I don't think, oh, this could lead to, because then you'd be, continually disappointed definitely and being present in a moment and, and even having a job you know take away the pandemic but even having a job is it's a personal achievement as well and it's something that you train for and and I I, I I love you know commend you for the positivity that you bring to each of those scenarios I imagine that in itself will serve you quite well when it comes to you know something that's just one episode you make the most of it and yeah. it's another thing to celebrate Exactly. It's being in the moment is a really it's something we all aim for because then you really wouldn't have too much trouble in life because you're in the moment yeah. um, but I do think uh, it's very difficult to do because you know we need to know when we're being paid next we need to know where we're going to be but we did we signed up for a career so that that is completely unstable mm -hmm. and what I love about it is it's it seems to be this industry that are being the most creative I know they're creatives but being the most creative being the most resilient yeah because we are naturally resilient because we are constantly being rejected. So because there's loads of us being rejected all the time, now everyone's being rejected because there is no theatre. There is a resilience that I feel like our industry was prepared for. Yeah. And it just means when it does come back, it's going to come back sensationally and all the feels will be there. I can't wait for the first night when theatre officially comes back. I mean, literally Me the, roof, the roof will go what off. What will you go and see? If you have a choice, what would you see? What would I see? Gosh, that's such a good question. I think I would go see... Hmm. I really like Dear Evan Hansen just because I haven't felt like I'd seen something like that. So I certainly would go see that. But I feel like I want yeah. to see a play. I mean, I don't know. Um, oh gosh, I'm just, all the th shows in the West End have suddenly gone I've, from I've my head. I kind of want to see a musical because I want to see, you know, all those th the singers. You know, you want people to be singing and dancing again because... You know, they've been in there, stuck in their flats or wherever. Breaking free. I think I'd like to see a musical, yeah. I'd love to see Tina. I mean, I'm obsessed with Tina Turner anyway, but just the idea of merging pop and theatre and rock and, oh, just amazing. Did you see Anne Juliet? Yes. We actually met that night. I mean, not that I expect oh. you to remember, but I college over and was like, hello, I'm a big fan of yours. You know, I met you're amazing. Oh. And you were very kind with your time, but we went to the same one and oh, it was so good, wasn't it? Oh my God. I was blown away by it. Really blown away. I mean, the talent on that stage was just incredible. I couldn't take my eyes off Jessie J. She was sat on the same row as me, just a couple of seats down. And I don't know what yes. that must be like to have a song that made you famous put in a musical and it someone else sing it. Someone else. 
but I mean, she was like really going for it. She clearly loved it, which is a blessing yeah. to the cast and a testament to, to yeah. them. But yeah, it's, and I love those shows, you know, they get a bad rap, I think unfairly, you know, it's a really smart show. And actually I think the best moment comes at the very, very, very end of the show when, you know, when they do the adjustment of the signs and you finally understand why it's called Andulia. And it's like, yes, this is good. This is good theater. Yeah, it's a great exactly. show. Just before the pandemic struck, I know that you were due to be in The Seagull at the Playhouse House. Yes. Going to continue? Do you know if there's any talk about the possibility of us getting to see that? Well, so we did five previews. Yes. And uh, we were waiting for the press night on the Thursday and we closed on the Monday. Um, we're all hoping that the Jamie Lloyd company comes back full swing. I think if anyone can do it and be innovative with their work, it's that company and Jamie Lloyd. So we're hoping for something to happen, you know, we don't want to leave it there. We would love it if everyone was free, get everyone back. And I mean, that's a classic example of what you were just talking about. Amelia Clark, big, big TV and film star. And this would have been her first time in the West End. So it, she was so good. And so, yeah, I want the world to see that performance, really. What was it like getting to work with somebody like Jamie and obviously, of course, Amelia as well? You know, people that I'm sure you've admired and looked up to their work and, and respected their work, getting to sort of be in that creative process with them, you know, being yeah. present in the room. What was that like? Well, that's the thing. It's the room, the rehearsal room when you're working with a company like that is wonderful because everyone's troubles, everyone's thoughts, everything gets left at the door. Everyone's in the moment. And we would do certain exercises every day. We had a... Um, a, a grid he works with a grid which is just wonderful which is trying to create a shared experience for everyone so we're all vibrating on a similar level so it was all it was quite spiritual and you have to trust really but I absolutely loved that process so yeah I loved working with them Indira Varma and Tom and just all of them really just an amazing cast Phil um Phil Robert Glenister Phil Philip Glenister Robert Glenister. <laughs> I still get them muddled up and I've worked with both of them. This might seem a slightly silly question, but what's it like when you get to walk up to a West End theatre and see the picture that I've seen of you outside there, you know, in all your glory there, it's got your name on it, on the side of a theatre, you know, you're starring in this show. Do you still sort of get the little butterflies in your stomach going, I can't quite believe this is happening? Yes, of course, every single time. Um, I remember Di Vivian Rose at the Vaudeville was it was just a three-hander and oh. it, you know it's, you can't even avoid yourself it's different when you're in a bigger company and there's just it's inbred in you from a very young age that you know if you if you're in any way recognized outside of a theater in this world baby you've made it it's like <laughs> that isn't it I'm very aware that it's nonsense and it doesn't matter the same as awards and all of those things I'm very aware of all that but at the same time you can't help but feel butterflies in your stomach when you go up to a theater for the first time after being in rehearsal room and you're about to go into the tech it's one of my favorite times it doesn't matter but it's nice we can say it's nice when you see that yeah movie. it's <laughs> lovely <laughs> Of course it's lovely, but it doesn't matter. So we're in your house today. So if you were to spin the camera around, would we see something like a huge billboard poster of you from another show? Have you ever been tempted to take them no, home? Or... No, no, I'm afraid you wouldn't. You'd see a, a little yoga deck. But um, I did have, the downstairs toilet has had a leak. Well, it's been happening for a long time. So the show posters had to come off the wall okay. and it is going to be being redecorated. And I actually, my partner said to me the other day, do you want me to put those all of those show posters in the loft? Or do you think you're going to put them when the toilet's been redecorated? Are you going to put them on the wall? And part of me just went, no, I don't think I'm going to put them back up. And then I thought maybe that's a pandemic thing. Perhaps if you do have a clean slate, it's an opportunity for you just to make more memories isn't it? Just going Absolutely. more shows. And... I'm all up for that attitude, yes. <laughs> so let's talk about your current project and why we're here, because I, it's unbelievably exciting and, and dare I say quite scary and spooky, but with this COVID <laughs> twist and it instantly got my attention, which is why I was desperate to talk to you today. It's called The Haunting of Alice Bowles. In your own words, because I'd love to hear from you, what's it about? And I guess talk to me about the premise of the show and, and perhaps the, the, the stream itself. What makes it different? Well, original theatre company, have done this this is not the first time so they've done this before where they work in front of a green screen and they send it off and and mac in the background so the whole process is something they're very familiar with i wasn't familiar with it and they have worked it and made it work during the pandemic so that what you're you feel like you're watching theater 
yeah. online as opposed to, you know, it's not on a stage, but you are watching a theatrical production with theatre performances. And it's the closest thing that I've had to being in anything theatrical or even to watching anything that I'm in. So basically it's, it's about set in 1918 and there are two timelines. So I'm in 1918 playing Alice Bowles. There is also 2020 is the other timeline and that's Max Bowden. Max Bowden and his um, partner are YouTubers in that time. So it's very similar. You know, it brings up lots of things about the pandemic because it happens, 1918 is around the time of the Spanish flu. So there are similar um, themes running through it. And Alice's husband has died recently and she is being haunted by him basically. And the two guys in 2020 are walking around cemeteries and in a kind of just, it's not devious, it's just they're, they're, they're looking out spookiness, basically, and they uncover some stuff um, that you need to see. <laughs> so you, I can't really tell you anymore. It looks amazing, and the visuals from it alone are just so intriguing. And, and you mentioned about, you know, filming it and the green screen in it and, you know, adding it in, but it does look real. I think that's probably the, the genius of this work is that it's, and it feels, I know it's been done before, but it feels fresh in that we're exploring new sub genres within this element of theatre. And I can imagine yeah. for you as, as an actress, as an actor, that's probably quite exciting to get to, you know, push yourself outside of your limits, but also from the comfort yes. of your own home. Yeah, absolutely. So in the comfort of your own home, wearing, you know, the, the 1918 costume with a hat and a coat, I've got gloves and, you know, I'm using all my own, um, I mean, they've sent me the props, but I'm doing all my own props and no makeup, so that was fine. But actually making a performance and thinking about how when we did it, because you're looking at a Zoom call, but you're not looking at it. You can just hear the actor. And there is a director on there too. It's, there's quite a few people on the Zoom call. So you're being directed, but your eye line is like here, like above the camera lens of your iPhone, all shot on iPhones. So your, your eye lines above the camera lens and basically you're acting and reacting to somebody speaking over here and your natural instinct would be to look there and reply, but you can't. So it was very new and very different. And to be honest, what I loved is that I was learning lines again. I was playing a character again and I was getting emotional and, and outraged and angry and frustrated and being able to, act again without acting hopefully you know so it was it was I really really enjoyed it I didn't expect to enjoy it that much how weird is it going to be when you actually have to do all the line learning but actually leave your house you're going to be like what this is strange. well I did <laughs> weirdly I have done two projects where I have left the house which was a feature film called Bull which was all Covid safe it was just a couple of days and then I did a BBC One show called yep. Lee Road which comes out next year so uh, they're the only two projects I've done and they were when the lockdown lifted slightly and they mm -hmm. I think they must have been able to make it work where you were where we were filming again um but I you know I have nothing in the foreseeable future so at the moment the only thing is Alice Bowles being the haunting of Alice Bowles being streamed until mm -hmm. the 28th of Feb apart from that it's anyone's guess that's exciting that's exciting that I, there are new a, things yes Absolutely. And also, it, we're, we are, I know it sounds ridiculous, but we are all in this together. Yeah. Especially the theatre community is how I really feel. Everyone is at home trying to really figure out ways to make this career and industry survive through the pandemic, for it not to be neglected so badly that it's hard to restart. Yeah, and, and I think it's very, very important. I think you make a fantastic point that theatre itself isn't like just, you know, flicking a switch and clicking play on a film and, and off we go. There are a lot, uh, you know, a lot more elements to, you know, even the creation or beginning the process of putting on a show, you know, not just in terms of learning lines and being back in a theatre, but, but you know, in terms of the physicality of ballerinas or singers or actresses or whatever it might be. It's, yes. It's a long process and I, I know it is slowly happening and that itself is just well, unbelievably it's, exciting. I, I, I worry about all those people that have like left college this year yeah. and they're match fit, you know, ready to go match fit. And then how can you be match fit if you've been at home, you know, unless you've been super smart? 
I think if if this goes on much longer, I do think that people will be having to, you know, because we've had, an, I mean, during the first lockdown, I put on a stone and lost it again. So, you know, we can, we, we when, if we know we've got an end date to this, I think people can work towards it much easier. And you've been one of the, the people that we've seen very vocally online supporting Excluded UK. You've been very vocal about, you know, people being at home and not being supported from the government as well. And I think that in itself is incredibly important that we remember that the arts are all around us. You know, we all have spent hours and hours watching Netflix and dramas and TV shows, but we forget that that is also a subculture of the arts. And it's important that we remember that we are really all in this together. And just because you don't go visit the theatre doesn't mean the arts itself don't need supporting. And, and I yes. think that's really important. And that's where perhaps selfishly I feel quite frustrated at the moment is there is this little pocket of the arts that is actually being excluded. Yes, absolutely. Which is why if I mean, if I ran a channel or if I had a television company, I would be creating a lot of work for all the actors in theatre. Mm. And by doing that, I mean, like, what? why aren't we seeing numbers from all of the shows that have been stopped why aren't we seeing excerpts from all of the plays on a television a mainstream channel so i know we can stream things at national theater which which i am doing i know that we can do all that but what about like a saturday night television special once a month at least yeah. you know where where you showcase our theater talent i think that's what you forget is there really is so much talent and I feel, I know. you know, it just feels like a waste. But I know that the BBC have got this amazing programme that I actually think is being filmed today, which is showcasing, you know, people from individual shows. That's happening. So I'm hopeful, fingers crossed, that we slowly Good. start to see, you know, yeah, the cogs yeah. turning. But gosh, I'm so glad we're in this January and not that January, that's for sure. Oh, I'm so yeah. glad we're through it. So now indulge me if you will, but you were part of actually one of my all time favourite television shows. And so I would never forgive myself if I didn't ask you just what was it like being part of the bill? In, in recording for that show because I am obsessed. I know there's TV streaming services and channels that allow you to watch it from the beginning. And I am one of them. I have literally gone back all the way to the start. So in, really? indulge me, tell That's me hilarious. Uh, tell me everything, please. No, I did one episode. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it was my very first television job. Yes. That and Men Behaving Badly, I think, were very close together. I really don't remember much about it because it was so long ago. Probably my least memorable job. It's over now. I it's know. not going to happen. I so know. you need to move on to like another police thing. Aim for that. Because I always wanted to be a police officer. You know, before I became a journalist, that was always the thing I was desperate to be. And I, I think it might be the fault of the bill and or bad girls as well. Like I was obsessed with bad, bad girls. Bad so. girls. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I've played about 933 police. I'm just trying to think now, what do I watch that's police led? I'm not very good because it feels like work. So I don't really watch those yeah, quite totally. so much. I watch a lot of comedy. Yeah, comedy is a funny thing because I, I normally am quite against comedy watching it on TV in terms of stand up because I always feel like that's something I want to experience in person. But yeah, there's been yeah. this wonderful phenomenon of recording live comedy. And, and I know that there's sort of um, lip sync battles and those sort of types of shows where they do sort of live performances and comedy roasts. So it feels like we're getting getting our fix here. Yeah, and there. yeah. And also, I think maybe because of the pandemic, we will come out of this being able to watch a lot more live performances on TV. Still going to the theatre, but being able to, whereas normal, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have watched a play on television. I think we watched the play that goes wrong with that, that Christmas Peter Pan that goes wrong, yeah. which we loved. But um, I, I was initially being, you know, not a theatre snob, but, but that being my roots, so I was like, no, if we're going to see that, we'll go and see it. I don't want to watch it on the TV. Now we're watching all sorts on the TV. Yeah, I feel like Hamilton has, and Disney Plus has, you know, welcomed and started a little shift that the pandemic obviously then um, joined in just, you know, different ways that we can support theatre. Yeah, we can appreciate yes. it. But, and I'm hopeful that people will continue, and I'm sure they will, go see Hamilton in their thousands upon thousands. So it isn't going to remove from, you know, people that will see shows, but actually no, benefit. It's the minute we're up and running, it's the first thing I would go back to see. Definitely. And I've seen the Disney Plus what Plus one, and I've seen it twice. It's so good, isn't it? Oh God, I love it. It's so annoying. I'm like, damn, why is it? Why is it as good as everyone says? I want to, but you know, it's fantastic. just as good, if not better. And but the thing is, is it grows on me even more. Like when we, if we pre-pandemic, if we were doing a long journey, anything of like an hour or above we would put put it on the minute me and the girls that my kids got in the car and my bloke and everyone's doing the bits trying to do the harmonies but not you know but doing the raps the eight-year-old singing the rappy sections and 
it really is a, a stable rock of our family. Well, I know if someone's in a mood, you put Hamilton on and everyone just lets rip. <laughs> I love that. I need to come live in yeah. your house. It sounds bloody brilliant. Yeah, I love it's that. crazy. There are so many roles that you've done on stage. Carousel, Sweet Charity, Oliver, Grease. I know you were part of that as well. Uh, is there anything left out there that you you still haven't had the opportunity to do that you would you sort of think do you know what I won't mind to go at that that sort of that's a that's a little bit of me in musicals Sweet Charity was the best and I will not top that I don't think because mm. I won't be able to um, in in plays I've never done a Shakespeare play never worked at the Don Mar I would like to do that I've never worked at the Almeida but I love the Royal Court I've worked there quite a bit and then and the National I love. Um, so I suppose there are theatres that I'd like to work in. As far as material goes, I love comedy and I don't do as much of it as uh, I'd like to. Yeah, so something funny. If there's nothing like, I mean, Boeing, Boeing for me was like all you would hear every night is people not being able to stop laughing, mainly due to Mark Rylance, but <laughs> not being able to hold themselves back from laughing is such a wonderful feeling when you're part of that. I love this idea of you being in a brand new comedy at the Almeida Theatre. That would just kick off the year Me in a too. pretty fantastic way. So I'm a very <laughs> much a big believer. Some people roll their eyes when I say this, but believe it and trust in it and push it out into the world. Don't keep it to yourself and it will it will happen. So let's keep everything crossed for that because I would love Thank to see that. You. As you get older, you start to just be considered for very different things mm. so you know your early 30s you're mainly playing the lead in things and the love interest you got lots of kissing and sex scenes and <laughs> as, as time moves on you you evolve into a different casting group and I just would like to maintain a level of quality work and so there's not anything that I go I must do that or I'm aiming for that but I would like to continue until i I can't see myself re retiring. Um, so I'd like to continue until I can't do it anymore, playing whatever parts suit me then and there. Perhaps right. even a, a career now you've done, Alice Bowles, perhaps a career in like a really spooky piece would be amazing. Ooh, Maybe I now you've it. dabbled. Yeah. I have dabbled in thrillers before, yep. two-parters and thrillers on television. But uh, yes, I do quite like the idea of that, that there is something thrilling about doing a thriller. That's mm. why it's called that. <laughs> Are you easily scared? <laughs> I'm not easily scared, no. I'm really not. Although the, the Haunting of Alice Bowles, there was something about it that was a little bit... It was eerie and it definitely affected me. But no, I'm not easily scared. But apart from... My kids do do a thing which drives me mental, which is hide behind things when I come in the room and then just jump out. <laughs> and they all do it. They do, and my partner hides in the... Up in the wardrobe of the kids and and when they come in to go to bed jumps out and the screams I mean why would you do that to somebody you love and that at the moment that's enough for me I don't need to see horrors as well your house sounds amazing I mean can we get cameras can we stream this this is yeah. like a tv show in itself I know can you imagine can you imagine <laughs> no I love this. I love this. Well, I'm so grateful for your time today, Tams, and it's genuinely a real pleasure oh, to get pleasure. to talk to you about this. And I'm excited for people to get to explore a new type of theatre and, you know, and get to explore something that, that's obviously got this new cast and these new opportunities, especially during this time as well. So The Haunting of Alice Bowles is streaming right now through until I believe the end of February. Is that right? Yeah, 28th of Feb. Amazing. I'm going to put all the details and stuff in the bio so everybody can go do that. But just thank you so much. Enjoy your crazy thank madhouse. You. It sounds amazing. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing it's you in this. Pleasure. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you in this exciting, thrilling comedy horror series, whatever we're conjuring up for you in, in 2021. At the Donmar, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Thanks a lot. Take care. You've been listening to Eleven, the official theatre podcast. Find out more about Eleven at club11.london or via our official social channels. <laughs>